Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. That's weird to say. <laughs> um, take two, day number two. I don't know why I'm speaking in an Australian accent. <laughs> Look here, not here, here, not here, here, not here, here. Got it. <laughs> so before I dive into my 10 more tips for beginner climbers, this video is a part two for a reason. So if you're just starting out climbing and you haven't yet watched my first 10 tips video, I highly recommend that you go back and do that first, just because those tips are a little bit easier and they're more for building a solid foundation, whereas these ones take a little bit more skill. So if you're kind of moving toward the intermediate range. Once you do that, then come back here and we can start the party for round two. So you've learned the first 10 tips, you've mastered them, and now you're back for more. Let's dive into 10 more tips for beginning slash intermediate climbers. So this tip kind of seems like a no-brainer, but I've included it because warm-ups can mean a lot of different things to different people. John doesn't like to warm up. I didn't have someone teach me this when I first started climbing, so I had to learn the hard way that a proper warm-up actually makes a huge difference in your climbing stamina. A good rule of thumb is to warm up with dynamic movement. So that could be jogging or doing jumping jacks or doing these weird skips that I learned during track practice. I know a lot of people who like to warm up by climbing V0s and V1s, but if you're first starting out climbing, V0s and V1s aren't easy for you yet, so they might not be good warm up material. So if you can warm up by doing something that gets you a little bit out of breath, then you're good. And never, ever, ever, ever stretch before you've warmed up properly because that's a good way to get yourself injured and nobody wants that. Flagging is when you use your leg as a counterbalance to prevent yourself from swinging out like a barn door or to give yourself leverage to reach a hold that's kind of far away or out of your reach. I know that sounds like a lot of words, so I'll just give you an example instead. This problem is a classic flagging required start. There's absolutely no way I could reach the next hold without flagging. Even Shahan can't with his height advantage. So what do we do? To be able to reach further to the right, we need a counterbalance on the left. This is an extreme example, but the next time you can barely reach a hold, try flagging on the opposite side to see if it gives you that little extra oomph that you need to reach the hold. There are going to be a lot of times when you find yourself needing to switch your feet on a hold to progress through a problem. But what if the hold is so tiny that you can barely fit one foot on it, let alone two? This is where the hop switch comes in. And there are several things you can do to make sure your hop switch is a little bit more successful. When you're doing the hop switch, there will be an instant where all of your weight is supported by only your hands slash arms. So you'll need to be holding on to something. The more secure your hand holds, the easier the hop switch will be. And obviously two hand holds is better than one, but it won't always be the case that you have two hand holds. So the faster the hop switch, the better. Another important thing to keep in mind during the hop switch is to keep your eyes on the target. You are much more likely to succeed because you have a lot more accuracy when it comes to replacing one foot with the other. Sometimes this isn't possible because you have a big old hold blocking your way or you just can't see it. But when that happens to me, I like to pull back or go down a little bit, look at it, know what it looks like in my mind, and then when I go back into position to do the hop switch, I can imagine where it is and what it looks like. And that helps a lot too. Lastly, when you do the hop switch, 
you have to commit. A lot of the times when I was first learning how to do the hop switch, I wouldn't hop up high enough with my first foot and then my second foot would run into my first foot because it didn't have enough room to get onto the hold and then obviously I would fall off the wall. So if you're gonna do the hop switch, make sure you hop up high enough to give your second foot clearance so you don't do what I did. After a couple weeks of climbing, you probably have a good idea of what most basic holds feel like. This is when you can start to recognize what's called the intended beta, or how a setter intends for their problem to be climbed. This is exciting stuff because it means that you can look at a problem beforehand and get a basic idea of how you're supposed to climb it before you have to waste any time and energy figuring it out when you're actually on the wall. Now, you're not trying to memorize the problem, you're just trying to figure out where the tricky spots might be, where the crux is gonna be, or how you're gonna deal with the weird looking holds. This also ties into the next tip. As a beginner climber, one of the best things that you can learn to do is build your hold vocabulary. This means looking for holds that are a little bit out of the norm and figuring out which way is most effective for you to hold them. So if you see a hold that you've never seen before, never tried before, go try it. Also, if you have a particular hold that you usually have problems with, for example, I have a really hard time with slopers because my hands are so small, try to climb problems with more of those holds so you get used to them and get better. Being aware of these improvements and focusing on them is what will take you to that next level in climbing. So what are static and dynamic climbing? Static climbing is generally more precise, slower, and more calculated movements, whereas dynamic climbing is less precise, less controlled, but a lot more power. Some say climbing statically is more ideal than climbing dynamically just because it's a lot more energy efficient, and it is. The thing is, I'm a little person. And in cases where, for example, Shahan can climb statically because his reach is longer than mine, I have to climb a little bit more dynamically to be able to reach the same holds that he's able to. Yes, I climb statically whenever possible, but I also don't shy away from a lot of dynamic movements when I need to, which is a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> So in the last video, we talked about using less of your arms and more of your legs. And for this video, we're going to talk about engaging your back and engaging your core. If you're like me, when I first started out, I didn't know how to feel my back muscles, let alone engage them. If that's the case for you, while you're climbing, try to focus on this area of your back on either side. And even if you don't feel anything and you think that it's not doing anything, concentrating on that part of your back will naturally cause you to engage it more. And as you climb and get stronger, then you'll start to recognize your back muscles actually working, which is really cool. <laughs> when it comes to engaging your core, that's usually more useful during overhang climbing. Obviously, it helps with other types of climbing too. But when you're first starting out, it might be hard to focus on your back and your core at the same time. So if you're doing overhang climbs, focus on your core. If you're doing other types of climbs, focus on your back. As you get better, try to focus on both of them. It's very easy when you're climbing to get caught up in what you're doing, especially if you're about to do a really scary move and forget to breathe. Turns out, as is the case with running, swimming, hiking, and pretty much any other sport, breathing intentionally can actually be used to your advantage while you're climbing. So if you're about to do a particularly scary or hard move, right before slash as you're doing the move, exhale quickly to give yourself a little burst. Another way that you can use intentional breathing is if you feel your arms starting to get pumped and you're not sure how much longer you can last, what I like to do is breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth a little bit forcefully and at an even rate. This is so I can bring more oxygen to my muscles and so I kind of distract myself from the fact that I'm getting so tired. 
If you do that for too long though, then you start to hyperventilate and you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I mean, unless it helps, I don't know. Maybe it helps. Climb sideways, she's crazy. I don't know what kind of accent that was. That wasn't an accent, that was just me being, just ignore that. What do I mean by climbing sideways? When you're climbing, the further out your body is from the wall, the harder it is to keep you on the wall because your center of gravity is further out and it's just harder and physics and science fact. So <laughs> what you should do is try climbing with your hips as close to the wall as possible, even if this means climbing sideways, even if it makes you feel silly. Even with V1s and V0s, which are essentially meant to be ladders, I like to practice climbing them with one of my hips almost up against the wall just so that I get used to it and so when I start climbing harder problems I naturally just do it on my own and stuff. It really helps, honestly. Just really, just go try it. We are almost there. We, ooh, we are almost done to number 10. ten. Okay, tip number 10, encourage others but don't beta spew. What does that mean? If you're seeing someone on the wall and you think that they're doing an awesome job, you can tell them they're doing an awesome job. You can tell them to keep going, tell them to push through, tell them they're doing amazing, tell them you love them. Maybe not that one, cause you know, you might get in trouble, but don't beta spew. So this means even if they're struggling and they're about to fall off and there's a foothold there that they can't see, but you can, don't tell them it's there. I know you're just trying to be a good person. You're just trying to help out. But imagine you're doing a crossword puzzle and you are trying to, you know, do it, but you're having a hard time and someone sees you having a hard time and then over your shoulder, they're like, that word is superfluous. And you're just like, come on, man. I knew that. Especially if they're trying to do a flash or trying to get it on the first try. If you try to tell them how to climb a problem, you're taking away from them doing it on their own. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Things are getting weird because I am reaching the end of the video. But you know what I mean. Got it. You got it. You got it. You're doing good. Your butt looks good. <laughs> uh, that's not the right. Okay. All right. Come down. And those are my 10 more tips for climbing. I hope that you found them helpful. Or if not, you know, I mean, you win some, you lose some, right? But thank you for watching regardless. Um, I will try to maybe make another video sometime within the next year because I'm in school and these take up a lot of time, but they're very fun. And I'm very happy to see all of the kind comments and support. So thank you again. And um, I still don't know how to say bye in videos. So goodbye. 10 more tips for beginner climbers. Beginner. So I had to learn the hard way that a better oh, blah, blah, blah. and they'll help you feel uh, to fit both of, uh, no 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 I mean you probably have a good idea of what make both but late the further out your body is from the wall a lot harder it is <laughs> what <laughs> what is that even? more often than not my hands are more often than not, my hands are too small to get a good full grip on a lot of holds anyway, but when I am... <sighs> what do I mean by climbing sideways? I'm not sure. <laughs> Did I tell you yet? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. That's all I have to say. Okay, bye.